Welcome to The State of Us. Real people with honest opinions and the future of responsible media. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. Recent mass violence incidents in America share common threads. Disaffected individuals who feel powerless, radical ideas that blame particular groups, and the use of social media platforms that bring these factors together and amplify them. Social media is increasingly playing a role in that process, according to the Wall Street Journal, especially among lone actors like the ones responsible for recent mass shootings in El Paso, Texas and Dayton, Ohio. Why do you care that social media is playing an increasing role? Because nearly 80 percent, Lance, nearly 80 percent of Americans today have a social media profile. And guess what? If you don't have one, If you're a Lance Jackson of the world, you're probably still on social media, even though you don't realize it. With that said, we can't begin this critical conversation on social media and violence in America without your friendly redneck liberal, Lance Jackson. 80% is a big number. That's a bunch of people. It's a bunch of people. But Lance has one, though. He does actually have one social media profile. I was going to say, add respect the bow tie. That's, yes. Yep. I think he would probably not generally consider himself to have one since he doesn't use it. Um, Well, he has one, but whether he's on it or not is a different story. Yeah, I didn't set it up either. Oh, well, see? You have a a profile picture. It was set up for me. Oh, Oh, okay. Okay. I was going to say, he's not an egg on Twitter anymore. No. So... With that, let's look at what the situation is. In 2016, social media, which includes services like Facebook, WhatsApp, Skype, Instagram, YouTube, and so on, played a role in radicalizing and mobilizing roughly 90% of lone actors. That's according to a 2018 study by the National Consortium for the Study of Terrorism and Response to Terrorism. You say 90%. How, How do we measure that? Well, let's look here at what it was by the same group when they did an analysis from 2005 through 2016. During that time, social media played a role in radicalizing 50%, half of individuals in extremist groups, where after 2016, 2016 and beyond, it plays a role in 90% of radicalization. What do you make of that, Lance? It's big numbers. I just... (laughs) I guess it's there. It's it's hard, I guess, for me to understand how big it is since I'm not on it, but I watch people all the time not being able to put down their phone that are checking Facebook or other media outlets on, on their phone, you know, and it's just – so it makes sense that it's big. I'm, I'm sitting here reading um, a New York Times article and, it, you know, it's, it's talking about the president's tweets and his – the amount of money he spent on Facebook – talking about his immigration policy and then also just his campaign in general. And what amount is that? And I guess um, it said, well, and I forget the months here, I think since the first year, it's like $5.6 million. And since March on immigration alone, it's $1.25 million that he spent on Facebook. Okay. Um, so five point, uh, a little over $5 million, five and, and a half million, million overall on Facebook and one point two five of that. Dedicated to immigration. His his policy on immigration. Um, and if 80% of people are out there, and, you know, obviously Facebook's not the only social media site that they're talking about when they say 80% of the people. It's um, maybe the new, like when President Obama was the first to use social media. You know, here we are six, seven years later, and now Trump is really taking advantage of social media to get the word out. But as a person who does not partake in such, it uh, it blows my mind a little bit and I can't really speak to, I guess it, you know, it, it would make a difference because it's amazing as I'm reading these quotes from the New York Times article, what the president is saying on Facebook, you know, how, how direct he is being. Again, not saying anything directly, but there's a, um, a person, a doctor here, 
a psychologist who says what the word invasion does to people, you know, the underlying meaning to most of us of what an invasion is, is that something is coming into our safe zone, our safe area, and we have the risk of being not only being pushed out, but being taken over and run by an outside force. That's what most of us think when we think of the word invasion. So very veiled messages being sent by the president by the the choices of the words that he's using on these social media sites. So you think that – So, I mean, I, I can see where it has an impact. And the, and the president seems to really be concentrating money and effort on this because only two Democrats running for president have spent – over two million, and it's just at the two million mark. And they are Kirsten Gillibrand and Joe Biden, and uh, Kamala Harris has only spent barely a million, and the president's at five point six million. So, I mean, is he cornering the market and getting the word out? And if eighty percent of people are on social media and he's spending that kind of money, he's doing a very good job, I guess, of getting his message out. Now I'm not saying I agree with his message, but he seems to be he's getting it out of he's getting it out on the platforms that that people seem to be using today. Well, and the data tells us the platforms that are being used to radicalize people or to further the radicalization. Because I think we want to be clear here. This is one of those. This is what Lance and I were talking about before the show. It social media, right? And this is and it may seem like a semantics thing, but I do think it's important. Much like a gun right, on its own, doesn't kill somebody. Somebody using the gun kills someone or somebody mishandling a gun kills someone, right? Same thing with social media. The technology in and of itself doesn't create, you know, these mass shooters. But you don't go hunting, but people, but you don't go hunting with a gun that has 250 round magazines on it. No. You don't go hunt deer to do that. You don't go hunt squirrel with that. I hope not. Coming from a hunting area, well, I think it's illegal. Yeah. It is great that it's illegal. It's illegal to hunt with that, to hunt animals, which, you know, the NRA and people want to say, well, that's why we have the right to own guns besides protecting ourselves. We we are, you know, we want to go hunt, Um, which is fine, you know. I'm not going to debate whether or not it's a sport. I I said if you arm the bears, then maybe it's a sport. But – you know, give the animals a gun, then it's a sport and we can shoot each other. Um, but yeah, there's my political leanings on the issue. But at the same time, everything was purchased legally and nothing, you know, when you talk about, you know, when the left wing radicals talk about, well, we have to get rid of guns and we have to do this. Everything that the shooter in Dayton had, by all accounts that I'm reading in the newspapers, was legally purchased is legal to, to own and um, would not have been stopped by increased background checks because there was nothing in his past that would – That have, would have showed up in a background that check. That would have shown up in a background check. I mean, there's some things coming to light now. I actually just read this this morning where his ex-girlfriend had indicated that he had actually talked about doing something uh, like this okay, before. But, you you know, know, but you're not going to find that in a background check. Right. I mean, and, and so – you're going to talk to all, you know, because where are we going to list all of our ex-girlfriends or boyfriends, you know, that the government yeah. should check to talk about whether. My point is, that's the disturbing point when you when you look at some of this stuff, is that nothing's being garnered illegally and nothing would be stopped by background checks. So, and not to divert the show, but. No, nothing in, in these cases. Right. I mean, there have been, we have had incidents where. It's been explained. And that's and that's the other problem is, is that even within the media, they're trying to group all of these things together. And there they're really don't seem to be. They are. It's amazing that there are this many different incidents. A lot of silos. But there doesn't seem to be a necessarily a common theme. And, other than radicalization. Right. Well, because, for example, the individual in Dayton, right, we know – Seemed to be, seemed to indicate that he was supportive of uh, people like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, right? Which is very much in contrast to what a lot of these other violent incidents have been supportive of, where we've seen they're very supportive of 
President Trump, right? Or Ted Cruz or somebody like that. Um, so it does span the political spectrum. And I think this is the key. This is the thing that upsets me in the wake of all this, Lance, is a couple things. The, the first big one is the media's ability to butcher the way that they handle these situations. Um, not only do they give, you know, too much attention, I think, and too much credit to who the shooter is, which I've always thought is wrong, right. um, because it, it absolutely does. And I don't, you know, the, the data here, uh, I'm sure somebody can find it for us. I don't have it in front of me, but we know that the more that we pay, you know, I mean, it's tribute for lack of a better word to these awful people who are, who are doing these terrible things, uh, the more likely it is that other people then see it as an opportunity to get their viewpoints noticed, you know, because it even covered in the article that, you know, he had written, right, this manifesto, and here were some of the things that were in it. And that's exactly why this is done. That's the whole point, you know? It's like, uh, right, when when a bully makes fun of you and and you give into it and you try to argue logic with them. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's what they, that's exactly what they want, you know? Um, so again, I, and I struggle with that because we don't want to not report things and we don't want to not make sure people are aware of things, but I just feel that there needs to be more conversation about that. So that's one thing. The other thing that I saw a Facebook post, Lance, by somebody the other day that you and I both know who's been on this show before, um, a young self-identifying uh, Republican, and I'm not alluding to our producer, I was by the say, way, just to be clear. I don't have a Facebook. It's not me. Yeah, just to be clear. Had posted about the shootings uh, or the shooting in Dayton. And here's the thing that gets me about this is on the left, for some reason, it's being made out that we are kind of pretending that mental health is not something that plays into this, you know, or we're downplaying that people who do this have some sort of problem. I don't like that because in my book, Lance, and I think to most Americans, if you are driven to go mow down random fellow citizens, you have some sort of mental issue, mm -hmm. you know, some sort of mental illness. Now, whether or not we have a classification or a term or whatever for what's going on in your head, right? Most of us would look at that and say, that person has problems. That is not a if you regular re thing to right, do. If you're going to resort to that level of violence, you there there is something not – you're having trouble with some issue. Yeah. You're not capable of – or you're capable, but you're not currently handling things the way that most of us would handle them. There's right. There's something there that needs addressing. On the other side, though, I get very, very frustrated with the right – when it's made out to be that we would not reduce some of these incidences by putting in place just common sense, you know, universal background checks. And in my book, license, you know, to own and carry any firearm, you know, there is no, there is no open driving law, right? If you want to drive a freaking car on any road in this country, and you want to do it legally, you got to have a license. So it just is absurd to me that we can't entertain the idea that to own a gun, you might also need a license. Right. You know, I'm sorry. It just doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. It's, it's absurd. But it's like a lot of other things that we talk about every day on this show that we people run to the extremes and 60 to 70 percent of us agree on a logical answer and we can't seem to come to the agreement. You know yeah, what I mean? Our lawmakers can't. Yeah. You know? Well, but see, now I'm going to, and I'm going to, I don't want to change the, the show, but we get the government we ask for. If, if we don't hold them accountable, be they Democrats or Republicans, to passing the laws that we want, then we deserve what we get. And there, that's just the way it is, people. The, the, it is written that we have the right to vote. And if these people aren't doing their job, we need to vote people in that are going to do their job. And I'm just saying that Republicans, Democrats, independents, 
And, you know, I was going to bring up the point when we were um, talking to the public on Tuesday, we met a man who said to us, you know, where are the days? And he was similar to my age, you know, probably between the two of us. He goes, where are the days when we could sit and discuss and we could disagree on something? And I think he said, call each other fools or idiots. And still at the end of the dinner or the get together, we would still hug each other and shake hands and be friends and talk about getting together again next week. That it was okay to have a difference of opinion and still treat each other as human beings. And, and that's where we're missing. And I understand your frustration with the government, but my frustration is becoming more and more with us as citizens who sit back and take this kind of government and not being proactive to changing the government. It's not, you know, I mean, President Trump drained the swamp. Well, okay, we obviously didn't do a very good job of that because two years later, we switched it again. And still, the majority of us are not voting. Even with voter turnout as high as it was in the midterm elections, you know, record numbers, it's still not enough people taking part in getting taking back control of our government. One, and it's we're going to get into the, It's the people's government. You can't get mad at the government if you're not out there at least doing the, the basic fundamental thing, which is voting. I'm going to give you the problem, though, with it being up to the people in just a minute. But before we do that, Lance, we're having this conversation uh, because we've got a mission. Yep. And um, unlike some other players, right, in this space— I think it's important to us. And that's why Lance and I concede that both kind of, I don't want to say extremes, but both sides in this discussion about what to do, they have merit, right? I've said for years, I am all for additional attention paid to mental health in this country. I don't care if we have comparable mental health illness rates to other countries. I, I still think we should pay more attention to it. I still think it's too stigmatized. I still think there's obviously more that we can do. Okay. So I think it's relevant to understand, right, that we have similar mental illness rates to other countries. So to say that that's the main reason that we have mass shootings is also a distortion of the facts. But to say that it plays no role is just absurd as well. True. You know, so and on the other hand, I also have problems right with this other side. And I'm more than willing to acknowledge that there should be better background checks. And I'm willing to go so far as to say you need a license. And by the way, that's coming just so that people know. From growing up on a farm, from knowing how to shoot a gun, multiple different kinds of guns, to having handled them frequently, to having used them to kill animals, Okay, so you can think of that what you will and you can make those judgments of me for having those things. I just want to make sure that people know that's coming from a place of being familiar with these. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't have a concealed carry or anything like that, but I grew up understanding and not I wouldn't say they were a big part of life, but they were there. Right. They existed. You know, I was aware of them. I used them. Um, so that said, Lance, that's part of why we've got this mission, because you and I can can talk about those things and not have to be one or the other. What is that mission? Well, we're trying, what we're trying to do here at True Chat is to educate people by providing honest, open, and respectful conversations. And if you don't think we're doing that, ethics at truechat.org. You can email ethics at truechat.org. If you want to look at these articles that Lance and I are talking about today, thestateofus.org, thestateofus.org. We've got a new section there, right, Lance, where people mm -hmm. can, can go and they can read these articles for themselves. Uh, trying to be transparent and open, right? Yeah, as somebody who reads two or three different newspapers pretty much on a daily basis, I think it's a very important part of our show that people now have access to those. They don't have to go pick it up somewhere at their library or newsstand or subscribe. They can now look at it with each episode. And so they know now they can see that we are trying to stay close to what is being printed. We're trying to be very open about, okay, here's what it says. And then notice, you know, with the, with this phrase, fake news is we're not being fake. It's, it's right there and we're quoting it and you can look at it with us. Yep. 
We're trying to we're trying to make you as much a part of the process as you want to be. And even if you don't use it on a regular basis, I think part of that should make you feel better about there's nothing to hide, right? We're not right. we're not being obstructive in access to the data that Lance and I have looked at to form what you're hearing on air. We're making that available to you so that hopefully you can look at it and also come to your own decision about. Uh, and if you think we're taking something out of context or misusing it, that's where you let us know. Exactly. Yep. And uh, before but we're we, give, we're giving you that information. Right. So many people out there right now are just, a, well, it says here that da, 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 and you have no clue whether it actually does or not. Mm-hmm. Well, now you can check us. It's right there. You can see that that's, it says exactly what it, we said it said. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about in just a moment. But before we get to that, we're going to take a brief moment to hear from one of our sponsors. Welcome back. Social media is increasingly playing a role in the process of radicalization through online forums, particularly among lone actors like the ones responsible for the recent mass shootings in El Paso, Texas and Dayton, Ohio. Before we went into the mission statement, and talked a little bit about that, Lance had brought up you know, it's up to the people, right? He understands my frustration with the government. I'll say that my frustration is also with the people, though, because the the comment that I was telling you about that frustrated me was from, you know, a self-identifying Republican in response to the mass shootings and, bla- you know, blaming might not be the right word, but attributing some of the reasons for the shootings primarily to, right, mental health problems and primarily to the degradation of the family unit in the United States. And while I'm not saying that those don't play a role, my frustration was in the refusal to acknowledge that there are things we could be doing other than those that would make a difference. They wouldn't make this stuff go away. There's nothing we can do, Lance. Well, okay, I won't say that. There's nothing that anybody's figured out that we can do that would 100% eliminate this situation. Okay. But we could do things to make it better. The problem that I, the, the thing that I worry about with the people, you know, you're saying, let's have the people make this decision, get out there and vote if this really counts to you. I'm not sure that there's enough people who listen or read or have access to something like the state of us. And this isn't a, you know, toot our own horn kind of thing. There's not enough people out there who have access to an open and honest forum with quality information because the time is spent on social media and because so much news is cultivated that way for people. We know there's a gambling mindset and algorithm that's implemented by companies like Facebook and Twitter to reinforce things that they know you're likely already to like. And the whole problem with that is then you're never exposed to alternatives and often you're exposed to things that are just flat out untrue that reinforce beliefs you already have. But that's still the problem of the people. If you're not going to get yourself educated, then I reiterate, you deserve the situations you're getting. We have to then, you're not... There are places you can go. Sure. People do have access to the state of us and things like us. If they have a phone, they can download the app and get it. They're choosing not to. They're choosing to do it another way where they are being then controlled, if you want to use the word. It's a very strong word by these algorithms. Okay. But we still have the choice as the people because that's what makes the United States such a great country. We can control that. If we choose to be lazy and let the algorithms of social media control the way we get our news, then we deserve the situations that we get. If we take control of it and say, I'm going to educate myself about these things and I'm going to go to the places where I'm going to get the straight up news and I'm going to take back this country for the people of the United States, we can do that. And I'm not shouting for the Democrats or the Republicans. I'm shouting for the people, for the common sense people of the United States to say, we're tired of this stuff and we're not going to take it anymore. That we are going to get out there and take the, the, the country back and say, no, do the common sense thing. Come to the conclusion that 70% of us can support We're not going to worry about the extremes anymore. 
If the 70% of us that were in the middle would all go out and vote, we can shut down the extremes. But we don't do that. We sit back and take it and let the extremes dominate and run our government and make our decisions. And so, therefore, we end up getting these kinds of things. It's up to us. We can educate. We can become educated and find this stuff out, become active in it, and take the country back. But we have to get upset enough to quit saying, well, I'm just going to let it go because it's not affecting me. You know what I mean? Or, or whatever the attitude is that causes people not to do this. You and I do this. Caleb does it. We're three different political spectrums. But we're all part of the 70% that can probably come to some kind of an agreement to make an improvement in the situation. I don't want exactly what Caleb wants. He doesn't want exactly what I want. But I think we can come to, as educated people, come to an agreement that would make the situation better. So I don't have to get my way. You don't have to get your way. He doesn't have to get his way. But I think we could come to an agreement. And so we, that big majority of 70%, have to come together and, and put people in into power or become those people ourselves, run for government office, so that we can say, come on, let's use some logic here and let's take care of the problem to some degree. And I, I, I want to say I agree from the standpoint that I think if people – If more people understood the extent, because I don't, I'm just going to admit this, I don't understand the extent fully to which social media has the ability to unknowingly manipulate people, right? Um, Subconsciously. And and this makes it sound like there's an intentional evil motivation here. The motivation is these companies want to make money, right? And the way to sell the best ads to companies and for them to see the best value is for them to be able to target you based on what they know will sell to you. Because the more the, time you spend on their site, the the higher advertising rates they can right. have. Well, they can sell more ads to you and they get more data on you, which makes the ads they sell to you more relevant, which all sounds... Maybe not harmless, but relatively harmless just from a standard business standpoint. The problem is that same, those same principles that a company can use to sell Lance the best and softest toilet paper that Lance wants, they can also use to radicalize Lance. And the, and this to me, Lance, is where it's easy for us to say, and this is a self, you know, realization thing, I guess, for me anyway, because I probably would have said this, you know, people can choose to not be lazy and go get the information. As I say that, though, I hear what I probably would have perpetrated five or 10 years ago and said that people who are poor can quit being lazy and go make money because there are ways to do it and there are programs out there to help them. They're just too stubborn and too stupid to go make use of them. And as we have learned, Lance, you know, and talked about on this show, the problem is not that they're incapable of understanding. It's that they've just, they've never been exposed to it. They don't realize these things. They don't, you know, it's, you can't ask people to know what they don't know. And I think that's part of what's happening here. The more that I read about it, the more that I look at it, you and I get it, but that's because we've spent a lot of time looking at it. And for the most part, we're, we would probably not be classified as heavy social media users. You know, we don't spend time in that space. The more time that I've been spending in it with my campaign, because it's a kind of a necessity for campaigns these days, the more I see how these people are operating in these silos that just are reinforcing what they believe. And it makes it so hard to penetrate it. And the, the scary thing is most of them, my perception again, so I'm, I don't have the hard data to provide this to you, have no idea that this is happening to them right? They hear about it in abstract terms. Russia did this, Cambridge Analytica that, right? They have this data on 80 million or so Americans. It's all very abstract. It doesn't make it very real. If you got the profile of the 40,000 data points that Cambridge Analytica had on you, then you might realize just how much they can manipulate you. And they being anyone, not particularly Cambridge Analytica since they don't exist anymore. 
I, I don't think I, people know it. That's my point. Okay, I'm not but then, sure that then, people know it. That's my point is that then we have to educate. Educate. It all comes back. I'm sorry. Every, uh, we've been doing this show for seven years. It always comes back to education. 80% if, of all of our if, answers. If, if, we want to, if we want to be manipulated, then we can be manipulated. If we want to educate ourselves, we can educate ourselves. That's where it comes back to the people. That's my point. You just explained my point is that we get what we deserve. If we're going to be lazy and allow the social media people to, like you said, put us in these silos or whatever and feed us this information so that they can sell ads, then that's our fault. We deserve what we get. If we're not going to take the time to educate ourselves and, and take over and do the things that started this country, and that is we debate and we argue and then we come to a common sense solution and we move forward and then we have some rough patches and then we say, you know what, we need to debate this and argue it and discuss it some more and then we take another move. That's where we have to be. Or we can just lay back and say, well, social media is taken over and so we're all screwed now and this is what we get. I agree that's where we need to be. What I'm saying is most Americans have no idea that the situation is as bad as it is. So we have to talk about it. We have to educate it. We have to put it in the, in the public school system. We have to go back to, okay. to working in, within the public school system of teaching the things that are important. That is being a good citizen, not if you can add eight plus eight and it equals 16, not 19, we have to worry about understanding how to be a citizen, how to think, how to come to conclusions on your own and how to know what information you can count on as being factual and what is not. Those are what we need to be teaching in schools, not whether or not I can pass this state test in order to get my diploma. We need to train people in the public school system for what it was, and that is to be good citizens. And I, we're not doing that. Okay. I I agree. I was wondering because I was going to ask you. There's if, my solution. If you didn't bring it Time's up. Time's almost up, <laughs> but I gave you my solution. If you hadn't brought it up, I was going to ask about that. You know, is this something we put in schools? For what it's worth, I'm 100%. It's not what we should put in schools. It's what was used to be in schools, and we've taken it out of schools. I, I I'm understand. not talking about a particular political agenda. My political agenda is teach people how to think and reason and debate so that they can be good citizens. And how to find reliable I, 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 information right. to make and, those decisions. And I don't decisions. care. Our decisions will be better. Our laws will be better. I'm not saying that, that I'm going to push my political agenda. My political agenda is I want you to be an active, informed citizen. And if that happens, we're going to have a, a stronger better country. I agree. I, I That's what I was thinking in the back of my mind is th we, ha we have to teach people how to think and reason. And that has to adapt as time goes on and the world changes. And the problem is we've moved away from doing much of that at all in school. And so we have to start with that, but then we also have to continue to update it to be relevant to our times. I did do some learning I did, I did some learning Good. in school about, um, you know, like we talked about the other day. We, Lance, we right? learned you pretty good. Yeah. Early on, we had to learn about how, how you phrase questions in search engines to get enough results to learn, you know, now that's not really a problem anymore because search engines have become, you know, better optimized. They would probably say, right. To understand what you're trying to look for. The point is, though, things like that have to exist and they have to be updated. We have to be talking to kids today about just how much of their information is out there. And I think we also have to be legislating because it isn't just people have to know it. Once people know it, we have to ensure that your right to your data is just as essential as every other right. Because as we keep moving forward in the digital age, you have to have data rights. And today in this country, you essentially have none. There are very little, if any, rights and protections you have that Lance has to do anything about the fact that he might be all over social media and Facebook might share that data with people and he's got little to no control over that. And yep. it wasn't of his own volition. 
Lance didn't try to go on social media. He didn't want them to have these data points. He would like probably for them to get rid of those data points. But there's no method and there's no legal. There's no legal right that I have to do that. Right. Exactly. Not as it stands today. So it's a multifold problem, but hopefully hopefully we've scratched the surface of it for you enough to understand it's serious. If you have not yet seen The Great Hack on Facebook, um, it's a new or on Facebook. Netflix, isn't it? Right, on Netflix. It's about Facebook and Cambridge Analytica and our elections and all of that. Um, and Brexit, by the way, talks about some about the foreign elections too. It's about that. It's an hour and a half. I'd encourage you to see it. While I, I'm i not saying that it's the perfect thing to convey this, I think it does a nice job of helping people understand just how pervasive of a problem this is, and it's one that we're basically not talking about at all, save the state of us. <laughs> and a few people out there thank, you know, all the lords, right? The God, no God, all the gods, whatever, that there are a few people talking about this and that we're talking about it because that's the only way that it's going to get any traction. So please take some time, look at it, learn a little bit and share it with some people because it's a way bigger problem than I think 80% of Americans understand it is right now. Lance, we've encouraged people to tune in because that's part of this, right? Mm-hmm. We want to fix things like this. There has to be more more people who hear things like the state of us Correct. and where there's more people engaging in an open and honest forum. So how can people tune in? Well, you have Apple Podcasts and wherever fine podcasts are found, Spotify and Stitcher. Yep. And of course, the state of us.org, right? That's where I go. Yeah. I don't use the apps. I just go straight to the website. Okay. The state of us.org. For the state of us on True Chat in Urbana, Ohio, I'm Justin T. Weller. I'm Lance Jackson. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Be the change.